Well, good morning, church. I am excited because we haven't even gotten to the study of the word, and there's already been mention of barbecue. So we know it's going to be a great morning. Uh, but no, ladies, seriously, that is going to be a great event. And so I'm currently trying to figure out how I can help. So um, maybe there to set up tables and, and whatever. But uh, excited to have you all here uh, this morning as we continue our study in the Gospel of Mark. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to open up to Mark chapter 4. We're going to be finishing up chapter 4 today, verses 35 through 41. And so, you know, if you've been, you've been with us for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, and you've been going through this Gospel, and it's been a very fast-paced Gospel. We've seen a lot of ministry happen in, uh, with, with respect to Jesus. And we've also seen throughout our time in this study, study, we've seen Jesus as the servant. And really, we see that thematically in this gospel. And again, would encourage you to have your Bibles ready and would also encourage you to download that Awaken City Church app. Again, it's going to be a great resource for you. Um, if you're following along today to click on that Sunday tab and you'll, or the weekend tab, and you'll find the notes there that correspond to today's message. And then all of our messages are there. And then also, it's a great way to kind of know what's happening in the life of the church, a way to submit prayer requests. All those things are there. And so before we get Start again. Just want to thank you for those who are joining us online. Thank you for joining us here this morning. And again, there are guests in the house. We're excited to have you here as well. And so last week, when we looked at Mark chapter four, we were kind of continuing our study, and we, we got into the talk over the past couple of weeks about parables, right? Jesus started to teach using parables, and we saw last week Jesus did something pretty incredible, right? He leveraged technology to be able to better minister to the multitude of people who were coming to listen to him. Now, during this time, as we've seen in the ministry of Jesus, people have been healed. We've seen Jesus be able to proclaim with great authority the scripture because he is God and he has that authority, right? And we've seen that. We've also seen the religious leaders, the Pharisees, come after Jesus and begin to try to trap him in some of the things that he's doing. So Jesus decided to, over the past couple of weeks as we've been studying this word, he's switched over to kind of start teaching through parables. And if you missed any of those, I'd encourage you to go back and just read through Mark chapter 4. You can always go back and do the study and join us with what we have there online as well. But last week, we saw Jesus begin to teach from a boat. There were so many people there. The multitudes all started coming over to listen to Jesus. And there were so many people that he got on this boat and he began to preach towards the shore. And if you can imagine a bunch of people there watching and listening what was going on. And again, kind of the main point, as we talked about last week, was, was kind of how to let your light shine. And he began to use that parable about, you think about the kingdom of God. And, and how the light from the goodness of a relationship with Christ begins to shine out in a dark world. And again, we talked about that last week. And this week, we're going to see something pretty unique, pretty, pretty amazing, something we have not seen necessarily in this gospel, in this study of the gospel, Mark. And, and today, we're going to see how Jesus has command over creation. And we're going to see that in the scripture here this morning. Now, as I was kind of thinking through this, through this block of scripture, and I kind of started thinking, you know, what are some of the things that bring me comfort? What are some of the things, you know, what, what are the places and what are the things that I do that kind of bring me at a place where I can kind of just be at ease with my surrounding? And for me, I have that one place. And some of you, I know when I say this, you're going to agree. And there's going to be some of you that are going to go like this and be like, absolutely not. Okay, and I don't know which one you're going to be. I'm going to let you figure that out. But one of the places where I find the greatest comfort, meaning I am the most relaxed, is on an airplane up in the air. Okay, that's me. I am. I know that sounds kind of weird. But here's the thing, and I'll, I'll kind of set the scene for you, because I'm sure many of us have been on airplanes, and we've flown before. And, and, and prior to, you know, being in Florida, I, I worked at Northrop Grumman, so I was an aerospace engineer, so I understand, like, you know, I, I'm kind of watching the plane twist and all that while we're in the air, so I kind of get into those things. But one of the things that I've always enjoyed about being on an airplane is that when you get on the airplane, you know, you go find your seat. It's like half a seat, really, but you, they call it a seat. And you get in your seat and you sit down and your knees are like an inch away from the, the seat in front of you. And, you know, before you take off, you're not supposed to lean your chair back, right? I sometimes do. I do not advocate that because they will tell you to bring it back up. But, you know, you can kind of, you can kind of get comfortable and you hope and, and, and almost sometimes pray that no one sits next to you so you don't have to fight for arm space. Okay, so we're in our, we're in our seat. You know, we've got our, our, our luggage or whatever, our carry-ons all kind of situated. And for me, when they shut the door, that is a relief. To me, that's a big relief. It's like there's no one else getting on the plane. We're all together. And my mind starts going to places like we're all breathing recycled air. 
We're all, you know, we're all going to just be on this little kind of submarine in the air, so to speak, for the next, you know, bit together. But there's something about being there. And then, then you know, when they, when they start taxiing out to the runway, they dim the cabin lights. That's when you know it's starting to get good. Like, you, you know that when you, for me, it's going to be a nap. Okay, like there's gonna be a nap coming. And as they're taxiing out and they're kind of waiting there and you're like, you're the next plane that goes and you can just feel like the brakes have kind of locked up and they're kind of starting to ramp the engine up, they're revving up, the RPMs are kind of going and then they just kind of take off and you just kind of sink back into your chair because of gravity and you know that the nap is on. And for me, I can just sit there and I'm like, you know, it doesn't matter what happens because I have no control. Yeah, here I am sitting in my seat. I've kind of got this seatbelt in, right? And the seatbelt will kind of keep me from moving around, but I can't fly an airplane. I certainly can't fix one when it's flying. I, have no, I don't have those skills. And so for me, I just sit there and I just trust in the sovereignty of the Lord. And so for me, I take some great, incredible naps when you think about airplanes. That's even when there's storms going on, okay? I mean, I don't care what's happening when you're flying, if it's turbulence or whatever. It's like, hey, I, it is, I, I'm gonna be as safe as I can be and I'm just gonna enjoy where, where God has me. And I think there's a correlation here. I think when, when you think about our Christian walk and, and, and as a walk as believers, is that sometimes when, when the storms of life come, when, when difficulties come and those difficult seasons come, you and I have a hard time kind of relaxing and trusting in God. We, we have a hard time relaxing and trusting in the sovereignty of the creator of the universe, all because there's a season of difficulty perhaps on the horizon. All because you're waiting for a phone call that you don't want to take. All because you just got some news, maybe from your doctor or from a loved one, that, that isn't good news. And there, no doubt for many of us, we've, we've gone through some of these difficult seasons in our life. And we're going to see in the scripture today a lot of application in just a few verses but we're gonna see the classroom, so to speak, that Jesus chose for the disciples and the others that were there with them was pretty amazing. He used an incredible real-world example, a living, breathing example in how to trust in the word of God, in the words as we see in the Bible. And I think for you and I, there's a word for us is that Jesus can be trusted during the storms of life. And no doubt many of us have gone through storms and maybe we've had great you know, seasons of difficulty that maybe you're going through one right now. But nonetheless, just because we're believers does not make us immune from going through storms. And I think there's, there's sometimes that we miss that in kind of the onboarding of our faith. We think, okay, I'm going to heaven. I put my faith, hope, and trust in Christ. But then there's times you start thinking, okay, now that I'm a Christian, everything should be easy. Absolutely not. It might be. It may not be. It may be more difficult. But here's what we're going to see in the scripture this morning that Jesus can be trusted, and not only with your eternity, but in the day-to-day storms that you and I may face. And so today in the scripture, verses 35 through, the, through 41 through the rest of Mark chapter 4, we're going to see the ministry of Christ continue, just as we've seen every time here in the gospel of Mark. Again, this week is going to be a little bit different because Jesus is going to show that he has command over creation. So let's look together at the scripture, Mark chapter four, verse 35. It says, on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. So again, it's a continuation from last week. I know we've taken some time off. We've taken a week and we've come back to church. You've had a whole lot of life happen in between. But here, you know, the ministry is still continuing. And last week, you remember, Jesus, again, was on the boat, and he was preaching, he was sharing, he was going through these parables and sharing all these different things, and, and the multitudes were there, and the disciples were there, and everyone was kind of listening. But notice what he says. He says, on that same day, the end of the day had come. Jesus said to them, let us cross over where they're at. They're in the Sea of Galilee. They're on this lake here. Let us cross over to the other side. And so he gives the disciples He gives everyone who was kind of right there some direction on where they were going. Because it says, let us, not let me, but let us cross over where? To the other side. He didn't say, let us go to the middle and sink. He didn't say, let us just kind of go there and spin circles and get lost. No, he said, we're going to cross over and go to the other side. Now, he left a little bit out, obviously, as we get into the scripture. And this was kind of the, the curriculum for the day. This is going to be where the teaching is But after this full day of ministry, Jesus told his disciples, hey, listen, we're going to go to the other side. It'd be about a five-mile journey by boat 
to go where he was to where he was going to be and going to an area where people would relatively not know him. He'd be relatively unknown. But here, this is what Jesus said they were doing, the, the son of God, 100% God, 100% man. He told them, we're going to the other side. Let us cross over to the other side. It says in verse 36, he says, now when they had left the multitude, again, they had left a the crown, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with them. So you can imagine Jesus now on the boat, and perhaps he was still probably in the boat that he was using to, to, to teach from. Maybe he got on a different one, but nonetheless, he was in a boat as he was, and there were other boats that would go along with him. But he said, we've seen in Scripture, they left the multitude. So the multitude, for the most part, was still there. There would be Jesus' disciples and perhaps a few others that would go along, not only in the boat that Jesus was in, but some of the other smaller boats, as we see in the Scripture. And so if you're kind of following along from last week, there was a lot of people you know, so much so Jesus had to get onto a boat that the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders were kind of coming after Jesus, trying to catch him in, in saying something or doing something that would go against the law. And so from a practical standpoint, they were probably leaving a very stressful situation. I think many of us probably can experience that from time to time, perhaps maybe at work, maybe at home, like we have these stressful situations and you're like, you know what? I'm gonna get in the car and I'm gonna go somewhere and I'm going to leave whatever that stressful situation is. So nonetheless, I imagine the, the disciples were thinking, hey, we're leaving that crowd. Oh my goodness, there were so many people. And they're thinking like, we're leaving a stressful situation. They're probably thinking, we're leaving this stressful day. Not only was it a crowd, but it was a long day of ministry. They're probably tired. And I think also from their perspective, they're looking and thinking, we're also leaving those religious leaders who are always out to try to get Jesus. So in their mind, they're probably thinking, we're leaving this very stressful situation. We're getting in a boat. It's going to be a cruise. It's going to be amazing. They're going to be serving some appetizers on top deck shortly, right? They're probably having all these things in their mind of what's going to be happening. Verse 37, it says, And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. Sounds amazing, right? Sounds amazing. I think when you, when you think of like boating and being out in kind of, you know, on the lake or on the sea or wherever it is that, you know, you're, you're sailing, whatever you're doing, when you hear that there's a great windstorm, there's like, ooh, I don't know if I like that. I don't know if I like that. And then it says, and the, and the waves beat into the boat so much so that it was filling with water. I don't know about you, but if I'm on a boat, I don't want it to fill with water. Nobody wants that, right? Because, I mean, you need to be buoyant. You need to be above the water line, not below it. That's the whole point of the boat. But here we see that this great windstorm arose. There's something that you have to know geographically about this region. In fact, when you think about the Sea of Galilee, it was surrounded and, and still is to this day by mountains and higher lands. And in fact, the sea itself sits below sea elevation. It's 700 feet below sea level. And as a result, because of where it's located and, and kind of the higher ground surrounding it, it is subject to these very quick forming violent storms. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm thinking, hey, let's take a vacation, let's just go ahead and cross that one off, right? I don't know if I want to go out and be in a violent storm on one of these. But here, the disciples, many of them would have been fishermen. They may have probably known this. They, they probably knew this about the, the Sea of Galilee. But here in their minds, they, they left a stressful situation and they're probably thinking like, man, it is time just to kick back and relax. we got a little five mile trip and the next thing you know, this, this windstorm comes upon them. And again, being fishermen, they had experience in the water. They've seen these kinds of things before. And this storm, though, would be different. And there, there was kind of a, a teaching moment, as we're going to see, and there's a few other things we're going to see from the perspective of the Scripture that relate to the storm. But there's something different about what's going on here. This would be a great teaching moment for the disciples and for the others that were there and also for us today. And it says the waves beat into the boat so much so that it was filling. And so as you can imagine, the wind was kicking up the waves and they were breaking over the bow, water coming in. And you can imagine that they were uncomfortable with that. Many of us would be uncomfortable. And, and it doesn't have to be waves breaking in and over into your boat. It can be just the waves of just chaos coming into our lives. It can be waves of unknown futures and, and uncertainty crashing upon us. And we'll see kind of the application as we continue on. Tony Evans says, 
Jesus had commanded them to get into the boat, and they were in the perfect center of God's will. Yet they were also in the center of a situation that was threatening their lives. See, I think sometimes our brains have a hard time with that. We want to think, well, if I'm in the center of God's will, then there should be like, it should be an amazing experience. It shouldn't be difficult. In fact, it should be real easy. And I think that's where I think bad theology kind of comes into play. I think that's where we have to lean into the scripture and realize we can be in the middle of God's will, doing exactly what he's called us to do, perfectly in the place where he wants us to be, and also be in a situation that is threatening in some way, that is difficult in some way, that is challenging in many ways. And that is part of being a believer. And you see this kind of classroom in a boat taking place where the disciples would kind of see, and now they're kind of seeing this happen firsthand. They're getting it from their perspective, but from our perspective, we're seeing the application to life that, that God can call us to something that requires great faith. We're, you know, by all measures, you know, we are in his will, but it also comes at a great risk where we are exposed in some way where the enemy will bring trial and tribulations and difficulties, all these different things. Doesn't mean that you're not in, in, in the Lord's will, because you can be there and yet experience these difficulties in life, as we're seeing in the scripture. So following God, as, as I talked about before, following God's will does not make you and I immune to heartache or troubles. It doesn't. It solves a sin problem, right? Coming into a relationship with Christ solves a sin problem, so it guarantees our eternal future in heaven by paying for our sins. We understand what salvation is. But following God day to day doesn't mean, you know, because we have a relationship with him, doesn't mean that we're immune from a heartache and difficulty and trials. And I think sometimes as Christians, those can test our faith. We begin to ask things like, well, does God care about me? Does God really care that I'm going through these difficulties? Does God love me? And we start asking these questions from a practical standpoint. But notice in verse 38, where is Jesus? It says, but he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Let me kind of translate that for you. We're dying. Okay, do you not care that we're dying over here? And this is what I find interesting. Okay, Jesus had done this incredible day of ministry. And this is kind of a, there's a lot of teaching points in here. But we see, first and foremost, Jesus is asleep on the pillow. And someone might say, well, does God need to sleep? No, but in his humanity, he did. So you see the humanity of Christ here, a picture. When we think about the doctrine of the humanity of Christ, where there's this hypostatic union where you have the deity of God and the humanity, a deity of Christ, humanity of Christ come together, that there are some things that when we look at the life of Jesus that he needed sleep. To experience life as you and I, he would need to understand the physical limitations that we would have. He would be tempted, but he would never sin. He would know what it feels like to be hungry. He would certainly feel pain. So again, we think about the humanity of Christ, and here we see this incredible, beautiful picture of our Savior, 100% God, sleeping, curled up, sleeping. He's probably thinking, like, hey, guys, been a long day in ministry. Peace out. I'm going to be up front. Okay, he, he, he kind of knows what's going to go on, but here we see him in his humanity. In fact, Guzik says, Jesus' true humanity is shown by his brief sleep on the boat. He became weary and sometimes caught a bit of sleep wherever he could, and so you'll see this throughout scripture. It doesn't make him less of a God. It makes him more human in this aspect. And so there's a way for you and I to identify in the humanity of Christ, still 100% God, 100% human. You see, if Jesus never got tired and could just stay up for, you know, forever, then, then how could we ever identify with him? Well, Jesus never got tired. How would he ever understand how it felt like to be me? So again, Jesus experienced life as you and I did. He would experience the same difficulties and the trials and the temptations. Now, he was perfect. He didn't fall or fail in any way. But again, we see this in the scripture. And so it says, they awoke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And so for me, in my brain, I start thinking like, did they kind of get together and think, okay, somebody needs to poke him on the shoulder and wake him up. Okay, because you can imagine like this boat is probably being rocked around, right? So much so water's coming in. I can imagine the disciples, and we don't have a clear picture here, 
But if I know that was me, I was like, well, I want to wake him up, and then I don't want to wake him up, right? Like, I don't know, you know, it's kind of a tense moment here. But it says, they woke him up, and they said, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And so apparently, they were quite unhappy with the fact that Jesus was taking a nap, and it's this choice of activity in this moment. They were scared. They never seen this type of a storm, probably, and it's, you know, probably how, how much wind was out there. And they were obviously exposed to being fishermen. They kind of knew what storms do, but maybe there's something different about this one. But they had a great deal of fear. But here's what I want us to capture here in this scripture. You see, in addition to waking Jesus up and just letting him know, like, hey, there, there's kind of a storm going on. We, we, you know, we don't know what to do. They take it a step further. They also made an assumption here. They made an assumption that he didn't care about their situation. Because they said, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And when I kind of think through that, and you know, we can kind of read this from the perspective of the scripture, and it's easy for us to kind of skip over and miss some of these things. But even in our own lives, when we go through difficult times, I think sometimes we may ask God, well, God, do you, do you just not even care? You ask our Heavenly Father, you know, I, if you care, then why, why am I going through this situation? But even in and during this storm, I want us to note what Jesus is doing. It's not just that he's at a place where he's sleeping, but he's at a perfect peace. He's at a perfect peace because he said, Look, we're going to cross over and go to the other side. And so he goes down. He's in the Father's will. And he's just going to be at perfect peace in this situation. Things are happening outside of the boat. It's being rocked around. But the Father's will was for him to be at a place, to go to a place that's five miles away, and he was going to get there. And you and I can experience that same peace in difficult situations too. We're going to kind of study that a little bit more in, in our scripture this morning. It says in verse 39, it says, Then he, Jesus, arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Now, talking through this a little bit more, Jesus finally gets up, and we notice that Jesus didn't wake him and say, hey, guys, how's it going? He, he just got up and dealt with the problem. I mean, Jesus, who had been doing ministry all day long, was resting, was at the perfect center of the Father's will, perfectly at peace, Disciples come down and they're kind of waking him up and, and now accusing him and not really caring about them. Jesus gets up. He arose and he rebukes the wind. He took care of the issue. You see, when we start thinking about this, you see the wind and the rain, all those things that were happening outside of the boat, which I think were pretty traumatic, those things didn't wake Jesus up. What woke up Jesus was the fear of the disciples. It was their fear and uncertainty of not trusting the word. Again, back in verse 35, we're gonna cross over to the other side. Trusting the word, which that fear generated this momentum to go wake Jesus up and to then start asking questions about him not caring about them. So we see kind of a little bit of a cycle here. But notice what Jesus said. It's the same words that he would use with unclean spirits. So perhaps, and there's some great dialogue, if you think about commentaries that are out there, that would say, well, maybe the enemy brought this storm on. Well, either way, we see this statement in there. He says, peace, be still. And he literally told the sea to be muzzled. Peace, be still. He's calling it out. Same phrase was used when Jesus was dealing with unclean spirits in this gospel. And it says, as a result of that, that the wind ceased and there was a great calm. So Jesus says, peace, be still. The sea immediately obeys. The wind obediently, immediately obeys, stops blowing, the sea stops churning. John Corson says the one who calmed the storm was the one who allowed the storm in order to teach the disciples to believe in his word. Again, back in verse 35, the very beginning of this whole thing, Jesus said, hey, we're going to go to the other side. He goes downstairs or goes off to, to, to catch some rest. But the very one who brought them to here he dealt with it, and he dealt with the storm, and, and he allowed the storm to happen. He allowed it to happen so that they would trust the word anymore. It sounds kind of like things that happen in my life and perhaps even yours, where God allows storms and trials and difficulties to happen because he knows when they come, the first place I start running is back to the word, and I start praying and seeking him like never before. 
because he allowed a storm to come into my life. He allowed great wind to come in my life. He allowed water to start coming into the boat, uncertainty to start flooding into my brain. And so what I would do is I'd go back to the word and the word is what kind of sets me straight on what I need to believe and where my faith needs to be. You see how this applies even to our own life. In verse 40, he says, and he asked them a question now, the first words he's spoken to them since waking up. He said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And I can imagine in this moment, this probably tense moment, they woke Jesus up, he calms everything, everything's like, all right, storm's over. And you know, it's kind of like this awkward moment, but Jesus said to them, why are you so fearful? And he asked it in such a way, and in fact, if you go back and look at the original language, he asked this question in such a way that kind of infers that they should have never been afraid in the first place. They should have trusted and what Jesus said was going to happen. He should have trusted his word. I mean, they've seen Jesus heal people. They've seen Jesus deal with unclean spirits. They've seen Jesus do miraculous things. Yet, in, for whatever reason, in this situation, they felt like, okay, this is wind and rain. This is different. Jesus must not have control here. I don't know if we can really count and trust on his word, but they found out that they could. And Jesus says, why are you so fearful? I, I, I told you where we were going. I told you it's five miles away. I didn't tell you what was going to happen between now and then, but you're going to get there and I'm going to get there. You can be in the boat with me, guys, and go through great difficulty, but we're still going to get to go where we need to go because I have commanded it. He goes on and he says, how is it that you have no faith? And so Jesus is now rebuking the disciples for not having faith. They knew that Jesus was the son of God, but they didn't know if he was God enough to take care of of this situation. And when you and I kind of read this, we're like, oh man, they should have just believed Jesus. I mean, they're in a boat with Jesus. Everything was good, right? But when you kind of apply that even to our own life now, I think you and I kind of lack faith in areas, especially when difficulties and storms come. And yet we have the word in front of us and, and we know God's called us to do something. We're certain of it. We're in the center of his will, but now we're questioning why it's so hard. We're questioning why it's so difficult. Could it be that the Lord is saying, trust him even more? Could it be that we need to have greater faith in what God wants to do in us and through us? Perhaps. But here are the disciples, their faith wasn't in Jesus. It was in a boat. Their faith was in a boat. It was also in great weather. It was in their circumstances. And I think the lesson for us here is that their faith and our faith shouldn't be in a circumstance or a physical material item. Our faith needs to be in Christ, in, in the word of God. That's what our faith needs to be in. D.L. Moody says, the greatest danger was the disciples' unbelief. One moment, just one moment. They, they've already done a lot of ministry, but just in this one moment, we can see how quickly things got sideways for them. Warren Wiersbe says, it was their unbelief that caused their fear, and their fear made them question whether Jesus really cared. We're going to talk about fear and faith in a moment, kind of talk about the correlation between those here in a few minutes, but their unbelief caused a fear with them, and that fear kind of manifests inside of their hearts to then start asking questions like, well, maybe Jesus doesn't care about me. And again, we're, we're looking at the story but again, when we think about applying it to our lives, I think you and I can ask the same questions. Have we gone through seasons where maybe we've had great fear and when there was great uncertainty, and then we start asking questions about, you know, does God really love me? Did he really send Jesus to die for me or just everyone else? And we kind of start asking some of these questions in our life. In verse 41, it says, and they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, when I was reading through this and when you're kind of studying this, I hope this captures your, your, your attention because didn't Jesus already deal with their fear? Didn't he already deal with the fear like the, the, the wind and, and the waves and the storm? Peace be still, it went away, right? When it says here in verse 41, even after all that, that they, they feared exceedingly. So there's this healthy fear and almost realization of who Jesus is wasn't like they were scared, going to go hide. But we see this healthy fear because they saw Jesus do something they'd never seen him do before, which was take command over creation. 
He stopped something physically from happening. The wind ceased. The waves stopped. They had not seen this before. And so they had this healthy fear of seeing what was going on. And so David Guzik says best, he says, in the span of a few moments, the disciples saw both the complete humanity of Christ, him sleeping up front, and the fullness of his deity. Don't miss that in this scripture. We see, again, some great doctrine here. The fullness of his deity and the fact that he has command over creation, But yet we also see the complete side of his humanity and the fact that he needed rest. And so you see this life of Jesus, 100% God, 100% human. You see this, these points here in his life. But notice again what they said. They said, who can this be that even the wind and sea obey him? It's the same guy who was dealing with the unclean spirits. It's the same guy who was miraculously healing people. It was the same person, the same Jesus who was teaching in the synagogue and had a command of the scripture and the word of God. They had never seen anyone be able to teach like that before. It was the same person, but yet in some new way, something hit them differently that day when they saw Jesus take command over creation. And they say, who can this be? And it tells me that they were still growing in their faith. Sure, it reminds me that even myself and you, that we can still grow in our faith. Tony Evans says, why does God put you in frightful circumstances? He asks that question. He says, so you will learn to fear him more than your own circumstances. If you fear him above all else, you will trust his word above all else. You see, we kind of develop that healthy fear of, of respect towards God, and we start thinking about the word of God, that when you and I go through difficulties of life, and we know I might be going through difficulties of life, but I have such a respect and a healthy fear of the word of God, I can bring it back to the word of God. I can trust his word above anything else, no matter what's going on in my life. No matter when the doctor calls and gives me the news, no matter when so-and-so calls, it doesn't really matter what the circumstances, but I can always trust the word of God. And so when you think about the scripture and how you can apply it to our, our life, David Guzik says the storm, this storm, could not disturb Jesus, but the unbelief of, of his disciples disturbed him. Again, Jesus was sleeping, but there was an unbelief there. There was a, a, a lack of trust that they were demonstrating. And again, you and I can certainly go through life and, and, and have kind of the same fear and probably thinking that the disciples said like, hey, I'm, I'm in the middle of my life. I'm kind of going down this, this road and I feel like I'm doing what God's called me to do. But man, I'm gonna be honest, I feel like the boat is sinking. I feel like the boat is gonna go down. I feel like, man, I, even though I have a relationship with the Lord, even though I have salvation, even though I know when I die, I'm going to go to heaven, you might know all those things, but certainly there's been times in your life where you feel like, man, the boat is going down and I don't know what to do. It's filling up with water and I don't know what to do. But the truth is, as we see from the stories, that the boat isn't going to go down when Jesus is on board. And that even though circumstances may be hard and difficult, we need to trust in the word of God. We can be completely in his will, but also be going through great difficulty on this earth. And it kind of highlights again, as I, as I talked about a few minutes ago, fear and faith, that they're interconnected. That fear and faith, there's, there's a relationship between those. You see, the more I have of one, the less I have of the other. So the more faith that I have, the more faith that I'm putting in the word of God and I'm trusting it, the less fear I've got going on in my life. Well, I know about me, and I'm sure about many of us in here, probably the same thing is true. The more fear we have in our life, the less faith we begin to have as well. So it begins to put those two things into perspective. Tony Evans says, it's easy to forget what Jesus did yesterday when we're going through a storm today. And I think that's true for all of us. God may have done some incredible things in your life, and it's easy to forget all those things. It's easy to forget that you're saved. It's easy to forget that your destination is is heaven when you think about from an eternal perspective. It's easy to forget that your sins are paid for when you're going through difficulty today because that's what's right in front of us. And I think sometimes in our own humanity, we have a hard time seeing the bigger picture of what God is doing. 
Maybe he's allowing you and I to go to, through a storm because he wants to demonstrate to someone who's watching the faith and the trust that we're going to have that no matter what storm we may be f- finding ourselves in, that we're going to trust what God has called us to do. We're going to trust where he's called us to go. But when these storms of life come, and I'm going to share four things I think that we can do, myself included, that we can think about, we can consider when these storms of life come. Number one, just as I think was the case when they left the multitude in this boat and they were going to start on their five-mile journey, we got to be joy-filled. And I'm sure that there was a little bit of excitement of kind of knowing where they were going to be joy-filled. And in fact, when you go back and look at James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, you'll see that even when we go through difficult times, that we can still have a joy that's not rooted on our circumstance, but rooted in our Savior. Be joy-filled. Difficulties are going to come. The storms of life, they're inevitable. It's not you know, if they're going to happen, it's when they're going to happen. But be joy-filled. Number two, don't let the terror outside sway you. And again, I think about these disciples as they were on, you know, kind of this boat and they were letting the wind and the waves, all these external circumstances now, override what God told them. And I wonder how many of us who are listening here today, how many of us are watching online or in here in person you no, know, we feel like, well, maybe God, God has called you to do something. God has planted a word, planted a vision in your heart. And yet you let these external, kind of these, these things on the exterior, these terrors, these things that kind of, you know, make you think and take your, your mind off of what God's called you to do and onto something that you really can't control. So again, we can't let those circumstances override the word of God because God has a destiny for you. God has a plan for you. Number three, you and I need to also know that we can't let our anxiety unseat us. See, anxiety has a way of taking us from kind of being perfectly situated and happy and content in our relationship with the Lord to now moving to a place because of fear, as we saw in the scripture, of not trusting Jesus, not trusting that he cares, and asking the questions, do you even care about me? Do you even love me? Anxiety has a way... To, to really creep into our lives and we start making irrational decisions, poor choices, because we've lost perspective, because we've, we've taken our eyes off of our Savior, off of the Word of God, and onto our circumstances. And then finally, don't let bad theology, as we talked about in this message today, kind of mislead you. Just because the situation is hard doesn't mean that you're not a believer. Just because the situation is difficult doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't love you. In fact, when Jesus went to the cross, he he went for the sins of, of those who had put their faith and hope and trust in him. So don't let bad theology begin to tell you, well, I'm going through difficult times, therefore I must not have a relationship with the Lord or the one that I had is broken or there's some sort of dysfunction in some way. Just because life isn't hard doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't care. Tony Evans says, There are no storms that come into your life that do not first pass through his sovereign and loving fingers. If you know his character, you'll know that he does nothing that is not for your good and for his glory. So perhaps his storm or the storm to come or the difficult season that you went through or maybe you're about to go through, maybe there's a greater purpose in it. Maybe God is saying like, no, no, you don't understand. You can't understand it from your perspective, but I'm going to use this storm to bring glory to myself. And it's first gonna go through my hands before it ever gets to you because I'm going to allow it to happen. But I know that if you just follow the word, if you keep trusting and you have faith and you keep your eyes fixed on me, you're gonna get through that because I have a destination for you. I have a plan for you. And here we see again in kind of this scripture We know our Father's character. He loves you incredibly much. He loves us so much. How much did he send his only son, Jesus, to to ultimately go to the cross to pay for your sins and my sins? He didn't have to do that, but there was no other way. God the Father knew that there was no other way. We couldn't work enough to get to heaven. We couldn't raise enough support. We couldn't do any of those other things. The only way to get to heaven, the only way to have and experience the forgiveness of sins was through accepting the work of Christ on the cross. 
That's what salvation is. And we see kind of in this moment as, as Jesus is using this real kind of classroom experience with the disciples, he's saying, listen, guys, life's gonna be hard. And he knows, Jesus knows, and I'm not gonna always be with you, but guys, you're gonna have to trust my word. You're gonna have to trust when I say that, you know, that we're gonna establish the church and the enemy is not going to prevail against you. He, he had to start establishing trust in the word of God. And maybe you and I are like these disciples and we're in a point in our life where we're, we've kind of started questioning some of the word. God's word is perfect. It's inerrant. There's not one thing wrong with it. It's true. You can hang your hat, you can hang your emotions, you can hang your very next step and all the steps of your life on the word of God. And here we see this teaching moment again where the Lord is saying, listen, I'm in your boat. I'm gonna be in this storm with you. I'm perfectly at peace because here Jesus was in the will of the Father. And so maybe they too should have been at perfect peace during this storm, knowing that, hey, there's a, there's a raging storm outside, but we're at perfect peace because we're in the Father's will. And I think there's so much application for you and I when we start looking at this, because when Jesus is in our boat, when you and I have put our faith, hope, and trust in Christ Jesus, and we have that relationship, so when, we, when he's kind of in that boat, it's not gonna sink. The only time that boat sinks is when you and I don't have a relationship with Christ. The only time that boat goes down is when we can't trust in the word of God because we don't, we've never put our faith, hope, and trust in Christ Jesus and what he's done for us on that cross. And I can't think and even imagine what my life would be like if I were standing here at this point in my life, not in a relationship with Christ with all the turmoil going on in the world and all the craziness going on in the world. The only thing that keeps me straight, if I'm gonna be honest with you, is going back to the word of God, daily being in it, praying and saying, God, I don't know what's happening and why it's happening. I'm very confused. I'm just gonna trust your word. I'm just gonna trust you for tomorrow. I'm gonna trust you for the next week. I'm just gonna trust you for where you're taking me. But I think back, if I didn't have a relationship with Christ, where would I put my trust? Where would I put it? Some rules, some laws, some leaders, some, some you fill in the blank, whatever it is, all those things move and they change. The constant. If you want to experience a place where you can put your trust in something that's never going to change, it's going to be in Christ Jesus. It's never changed. Throughout the entire time, we have had the word of God throughout the entire time that we've seen the existence of the church, if you want to know with 100% certainty that you're going to go to heaven, then you put your faith, hope, and trust in Christ. That's how you do it. And when you do that, there's an opportunity for great peace in your life. No matter what I may have done before, no matter where I may fall in the future, that I have a relationship with Christ and I've truly accepted that in my heart. And because of that, I have forgiveness of my sins. And so if you're here, you're listening, you're watching, you're here in person, if you've never had Jesus kind of come into that boat, come into to your life, so to speak, into to the, the boat that is represented, like, representative of your life, you've never had him come into that, I, I encourage you, don't go another five minutes without considering that. Don't go another day without having some sort of way to have certainty that no matter what happens tomorrow, that your future is secure. My future is secure. No matter what happens tomorrow, the week after that, or the year after that, all of us who are believers, our future is secure. It says in Romans 3.23 that every single one of us have fallen short of God's glory. Every single one of us. That God has a standard, and when you think about his standard, none of us are able to meet it on our own, and so that's why he sent Jesus. We're, we're studying about the life of Jesus now, and here in Mark chapter 4, we're seeing the ministry of Jesus and how he's had command now over creation. We're seeing the deity of Christ in fullness here. But every single one of us, I don't care if you're listening to this now, watching it later, if you're in this room, every single one of us have fallen short of God's glory. That means we don't meet the standard on our own. So what are we going to do about that? Well, it says in Romans 5, 8, it says, while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so when you think about Jesus who had command over the physical realm, over creation, ultimately, at the end of his ministry, he would be crucified on a cross. Whether you go to church or whether you've been at church a lot or not, certainly you've heard about that. But he goes to the cross because he knew that was the only way. That was his father's will. And when Jesus gave up his life 
on that cross, there was a payment that was made. And that payment was for your sins and my sins. And it says, well, we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus didn't do anything wrong. Jesus didn't sin. But likewise, you and I could never do enough right. Likewise, you and I could never do enough good to earn God's favor. It was only through his son, Jesus Christ. And so when you think about, well, how does one go about bringing Jesus into their life, into the boat, so to speak, with them? How does one have this great certainty in their life of how to do this? It's real simple. In the scriptures, you see in Romans 10, 13, it tells us to call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. That when we think about repentance, it's the idea of turning from our old ways of trusting in our future based on what we can do and turning to the ways of the Lord, which says it's through my son that you'll have forgiveness of your sins and certainty of your future. It's through Jesus Christ. And to the person who's here today, the person who's watching online, who's never had Jesus come into the boat, here is your opportunity to do that. And you can do that where you are seated. It's a moment between you and God. And so I'm gonna ask that we would just close our eyes and bow our heads, just have this moment. But if you're here today and you've never asked Jesus into your life, he's never been asked to come into that boat right now, I'm gonna ask you to do something bold because I'm gonna be able to pray for you. Again, no one's looking around. But if you today wanna ask Jesus into that boat of your life and to ask him to be your Lord and Savior, you just hold your hand up again. I wanna pray for you. I wanna be able to pray and lead you in a prayer. For those of you who are responding, you can pray a prayer like this. Father, I know that I'm a sinner, and I know because of your son, Jesus Christ, that I have the opportunity to have the forgiveness of my sins and have certainty of my future in heaven with you forever. And so, Lord, today, I put my faith, hope, and trust in the work of Jesus. I know my sins are forgiven, and I will follow you all my days. And if you prayed that prayer for the first time, you now have Jesus in your boat. You now have great certainty about the future in which God has. And I encourage you to be in his word. So Father, I pray for those who prayed that prayer, whether that was in person or, or there online, Lord. I pray, Lord, I pray for their strength and I pray for their ability to continue to follow you even when times are difficult. And Lord, I pray for those who are believers. Maybe there's some people who've been believers for, for a long time now, Lord, but they've had difficulty in following you in the storms. Lord, I pray there would be a boldness, a freshness in their walk to understand that no matter what the circumstances are, Lord, as long as they're following you, they're in the center of your will. So Lord, Lord go before us this week. Lord, encourage the saints. Lord, give us opportunity to trust you even more. And we ask this in your holy son's name. Amen.